so my name is uh, Fabien Gengen. I'm a researcher, director of research at uh, INRIA, Sophie Antipolis in France. And uh, I'm leading a, a lab there, which is called WIMIX. And I'm also, I also have a, a second hat, which is I'm uh, the W3C uh, representative of INRIA. This, I, I vote for INRIA at the uh, World Wide Web Consortium. And you will see that a lot of things are influenced by the fact we, we work a lot with the web. Um, so there are about 40 people in my team, so everything I'm going to be presenting today is, is to be credited to these different person, members of a team. Uh, there is one common topic in the team, which is to look at the formal semantics and social semantics on the web, and whenever we can, try to bridge them, try to use one for the other, try to migrate something from one world to another one. And uh, I go into the detail. If I was to summarize a little bit the scenarios on which we're working my team, imagine someone is interested in the topic of recycling, waste recycling. The sort of thing we would like to be able to do is to detect that a group of persons have authored a, a, a book on waste, and there is a semantic link between the notion of recycling and, and the notion of waste. And that also one of the author is part of a team in an organization, and maybe the team is relevant, therefore, for that search. Uh, that there is an expert out there who is actually uh, in charge of managing a interest group or community, and he is recognized in the topic of ecology, which is also linked. So we would like to push that expert and the, um, the, the forum and the community we detected. Uh, but also that someone else is currently not searching, but bookmarking on the topic of pollution, and that there is a link, maybe, and there is an interest to, make, to put these two people in, in touch. That other people may have equivalent questions and therefore could participate to the search. And also, at the opposite, that maybe someone in a competing company is interested in the topic, and that instead of trying to put them in contact, in that case, we are going to try to separate them to make sure that no information goes from one to another because there is a competition between these groups. The second thing I'd like you to consider is if you look at the different facets of the web, uh, websites, social web, um, well, web of data, uh, the services that are available and composed, and the semantic webs, uh, there's one thing which is really important in our group is that behind each one of these facets, there is a graph. Uh, there is a graph of link between pages, there is a graph of so social network, there is a graph of link data, there is a graph of the workflow of composition of services, there's a graph of the hierarchy in the schema, there are graphs everywhere. And what we are interested in is bridging all these graphs together in a structure that we call tag graph to be able to mix graph together and to resume on them, on these different facets altogether. So we're interested analyze, model, formalize, and implement social semantic web application for epistemic communities. That's the way I would summarize the work in my group. And there are two research directions in my group. One which is to look at multidisciplinary approach for analyzing and modeling uh, the, in a, the system we have, the web application, the communities. So the many aspects they have and which are linked together, and the communities of user and their interaction. And once we have a model, to formalize that model, if needed or if interested, or part of that model, to be able to resume on it using type graph in order to provide new analysis tools for the uh, community manager, for instance, and new functionalities and eventually um, better application platform. So I'm going to use a bit of my time to give you some background. I was hoping that uh, among the speakers before me this week, there would be someone defining all the terms I need about semantic web. Unfortunately, this didn't happen. And this is a summer school, so I have to make sure that everyone uh, stays with me on board. So I'm going to use a bit of my time. Maybe I won't be able to talk about all our research results, but at least you will understand the first one. To uh, recall you a number of, of terms, uh, the web is 25 years old, OK? Uh, which means it is, it is getting older than most of my students, which is a bit depressing sometimes. And you can follow all the activities uh, that are around uh, this anniversary on, online if you follow this hashtag. Uh, this is a of uh, the first web browser developed by Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, this screenshot is uh, from uh, 1990. And uh, one thing which is interesting for me in this screenshot, apart from the fact that he was using the uh, very nice next step environment to develop it, is the first World Wide Web browser menu included an, an option called Edit. 
So when the web was born, it was not only open to read for everyone, it was read-write open. Anyone could modify any page he or she was looking at. And of course, when it went out in the next year through Mosaic, I think that this was forgotten for good and bad reason, for all sorts of reasons I'm not going to go into today. And we will have to wait until 1994, Cunningham's and the invention of the wikis for the web to reopen in the right mode. And as a result, uh, we started to log the activities on this right open uh, website, and we started to for social web network or social networks on the web. What's interesting for me today, uh, in the, the context of social web application, the notion of social tagging, that is the fact that users uh, collaboratively create and manage tags to organize categories of content, for instance, photos on Flickr, uh, videos on YouTube, you name it. And when they do that, the data structure behind this tagging activity is called a folksonomy, which is what happens when a crowd of users categorize these resources with tags. It creates a tripartite graph where you have nodes of type user, you have nodes of type resource, for instance, the image, and the tag that are used. So this means this user used that tag on that resource, for instance. And this structure is very interesting for us, and we'll see uh, that one, one, one of the challenges we looked at is how we can mine folksonomies. The second uh, set of keywords I need to introduce are all the keywords about semantic web. So I'm sorry for all of you who already know about semantic web, but I have to redefine RDF, RDFS, Sparkle, and everything, because I'm going to be using it. This is the, um, the first page that Wendy already showed before, the first page of the report written by Tim Berners-Lee to get funding for his uh, proposal at, at CERN. Uh, and, and this um, first page has indeed this very nice uh, graphic to explain what the web would be about. And what is really interesting for me in that uh, first page is that you have different types of resources. It's not, it's not only about linking pages. It's about linking all sorts of resources together. Of course, there are documents, but there are also people, there are hierarchies, there are topics, all sorts of things are linked within this graph. And the second point, which is extremely important, is that types of the links are different. It's not only about having a blue link between a page and another one. It's about having a whole variety of links between a whole variety of resources. And depending on the type of links, you're not going to do the same processing. So unfortunately, it was too complex at the beginning. And we went for the documentary dimension of the web, which is pages and links between them. But this was all in the beginning. And this is the real, for me, beginning of the semantic web. Years later, and I'm really making a long story short here, uh, we standardized at WCC uh, a bunch of standards, uh, a list of standards uh, that you have here on, this, on the screen. Uh, this is the pile of standards of the semantic web. And I'm going to just define a few of them. Are what we could call the uh, construction brick of the web of linked data. Uh, it contains a representation language to exchange data on the web, which is RDF, and a query language to actually access this data on the web. RDF stands for Resource Description Framework. It's a triple model. That means everything you want to say on the uh, web of data, the semantic web, you're going to cut it down into triples. So for instance, if your document was authored by Fabian and is about music, you're going to cut it into how many triples? Two, yes. Two triples has for author Fabian, document has for theme music. And you can put it. You can see them as predicates. But even more interesting, in my opinion, you can see them as the arc graph. A small graph around a document which has an arc author linking it to the resource Fabian and another arc theme linking it to music. Okay? That's the principle of RDF. What's important happened in the 90s is the and that is the perception we have about the addresses on the web. We went from this notion of URL, that is the idea of identifying what exists on the web, especially a web page, 
to the notion of URI, which is the idea of identifying on the web what exists. That is, I can give a URI to that chair, and now I can talk about it on the web. And of course, that chair is not on the web. It cannot go through the web. Okay, a copy can go through the web through 3D printing now, but this chair cannot go through the web. Okay. And this completely changed the way of seeing the web. Suddenly, it's not about talking about web pictures. It's about talking about everything on the web. So my previous graph, I can now change it a little bit. And everything, I name it with URIs. There is a URI for me. There is a URI for the document. There is a URI for the type of link between them. And if I don't want to give a URI, if I just want to give an attribute a value, I can put a literal value. OK, so now you know everything about RDF. There are syntaxes to write this graph down in order to publish them on the web server. If you have a graph and you want to make it public, you're going to have to write it down. For example, there is an XML syntax, there is a total syntax, there is JSON, everything you want. There are syntaxes, concrete syntaxes, to write this graph data on the web. One important syntax is the RDFA syntax, which has the ability to give, take some data like RDF and put them inside a, page, a web page to embed them in a page. For instance, this kind of approach allows you to have the I like button. When you click the I like button of Facebook, the little script behind the I like button looks at the content of the page and extracts the data that are marked in it in order to say, oh, Fabian just said he liked this car. Okay. Another point which is important, these syntaxes allow me to distribute that graph. That is, this first little uh, triple here could be on a server in Tokyo, and this second one could be in Paris, on another server. And because they're using the same URI, if a crawler, like the one of Google, goes above this data, it can then rejoin and recreate the, the graph. So we're talking about global giant graph of data, an open way of leaking data in a global giant graph. That's what RDF allows us. How do we publish that and how do we access it? Uh, so to do that, I'm going to use the French recipe for a very well-known uh, um, dish, which is the ratatouille. And I'm going to give you a secret that should never go outside this room, which is the secret of the ratatouille. One of the secrets when you're cooking a ratatouille is that each one of the ingredients should be cooked separately. Very little people know that. You have to cook them separately, and then, only then, do you mix them to, put it, to, to obtain a ratatouille. And this ratatouille is actually used as an ingredient for all the dishes, by the way. Okay? So if you understood that, you just understood linked open data. I just have to replace <laughs> ingredients by data. Every one of us in our organization, we have data. We can prepare them locally. You know, thanks to God, my bank is not publishing my bank account in linked open data. I don't want that. They're going to, to decide why they publish. They prepare it locally. Then this data can be used and combined to create new data, for instance, an average of a region. And this average becomes new data for someone else. These are the principles that Wendy already went through. I put them in the slides to, for the, you to have uh, them in mind after. They just say that you publish your data in RDF. Everything you talk about, you, like a chair, you give it a URI. When someone goes to that URI, you answer giving data about that URI. So if I go to the URI of that page, you give data saying this URI is a, pay, is, um, is a chair, which is in the UCAM and blah, blah, blah. You describe the thing. And you include as many links as you can to other things. So for instance, you include a link to the URI that represent UCAM, so that the people can follow the link. And just like at the beginning of the web, we would discover the web going through the page, we're now doing the same with data. We're discovering data going through the web. In 2007, uh, with uh, now a quite huge number of data sets being online, all these bubbles are data set. There is a link when a data set is linked to another one. And the central one is DBpedia, which is, uh, roughly speaking, 400 million triples extracted from, DBpedia, or from Wikipedia. That includes the uh, birth date of uh, Victor Hugo or the GPS coordinate of uh, the Eiffel Tower, for instance. All that. Okay. Ready to be used and query. To add language, and this query language is Sparkle. It allows you to 
write a query to extract a piece of data that you need. So for instance, here I'm connecting to DBpedia. I'm writing a query to get of the capitals in Europe, in, in English and in Japanese. And DBpedia gives me that for free directly, ready to be put in my database and reused. On top of that, I can start to rezone. And that's uh, when we need to actually not only publish the data of the data, to explain what to expect or not from the data. Two standards allow us to do that, RDFS and R. This is a very light way of doing schemas on the web, and if you prefer, ontologies. It allows you to tell you to say that the category of report or the class of report is a subclass of document. Traduction, translation, sorry. If a URI is of type report, a system can automatically infer and add that it is also of type document. So it's interesting, for instance, for a search engine. If, a search, if, if you search for document about Quebec, the system will also retrieve reports about Quebec because it's able to prove that any report is a document. And you can do the same with the type of the arcs. More power, you can use the other language, which is OWL. Each one of these little drawings is actually a logical constructor that allows you to do even more inferences. So this is OWL in one slide. So for instance, here I can use the intersection and I could declare that the class of men is the intersection of the class of male and the class of person. So every time a URI is typed as man, it will also be typed as male and person and vice versa. If someone, if a crawler finds a URI which is of type male and person, it can infer automatically that it is also a man and add it to the knowledge base, ready to be queried. Finally, there is a, a last way of doing uh, semantics, uh, another way of doing semantics, which is not about ontologies, not about classes of things, because not everything is a class. It's scopes, and scopes allows you to do what I would call scissors here. So, for instance, uh, we've seen examples of scissors yesterday uh, in, in the medical science, and uh, in any library here, the index of the library could be captured using scores, for instance, to say that algebra is narrower than mathematics, okay? And to reason on that. And I'm not talking about classes here. You know, there's no such thing as a class of mathematics. I'm not going to instantiate mathematics and have object one of type mathematics, object two. No, I'm talking about topics. This can be represented through scores that allows you to capture all the different linguistic var variation that could be attached to a term, uh, even distinguish the, your, the one you prefer, and also to capture the hierarchy between them, the narrower, the broader, and the link between them. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> that was the semantic web in 10 minutes. <clears throat> now I can say what we're doing in my team. Uh, any question on that? No? Remarks? No. Thanks. Very good. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Okay, so first thing I promised I would uh, talk about is folksonomy and the fact that they are flat. So uh, if you look at a website, a social website such as Delicious that allows you to share your bookmarks, <clears throat> it, uh, the bookmarks are tagged and therefore it creates a folksonomy. And why do I say it's flat? It's because, for instance, if a bookmark is bookmark with renewable energy and another one is uh, bookmark with a solar panel, I don't know that solar panel is narrower than renewable energy. Okay? And I'd like to be able to do that. So can I reinfer the structure which is missing? Can I recreate, restructure that? So he was one of the PhD in my team, uh, Freddie Limpens, and the way he did it is he combined three different approaches to that. The first one is a terminological approach. It, use, it uses terminological distances that looks at the terms and compares them together. Uh, so if you want to look at the formula, they are the Mongelcan uh, Soundex formula that are used here. And for instance, it's going to detect that pollution has some resemblance with pollutants, and maybe there is a, a link here. The second kind of metrics we're using is contextual metrics. So we're using not the tag themselves, but the tags there that co-occur with them. We look at the context of usage of tags. So for instance, if 
automobile and, and car are used in the same context, this matrix are going to say metric um, metric sorry is going to say oh there might be a link between automobile and car. And so, for instance, in our domain, it detects that aldehyde is usually used with uh, oxidazot. And I'll explain why we have that later, because we're working with the uh, Energy Agency of France. And this last family of metrics we're using is a social metrics. We are comparing the tags through the inclusion of the community of user. So if a community of user is heavily using pollution, and this community is more or less included in a broader community, using the tag environment, then we will suggest that there might be a link, especially a narrower link, between pollution and environment in that context. So we use these three metrics in parallel, three families of metrics in parallel. And during the night, we calculate candidate structure for the folksonomy. Using the ADEM, uh, so that's the French Agency for Energy and Environment, uh, we extracted uh, some data from their uh, from their legacy systems. And during the night, we've been able to suggest that there was 60,000 related link, 11,000 hyponyms, so that's narrower, broader, and 3,000 spelling variations. Uh, that could be spelling mistakes or different ways of writing correctly. And of course, this is full of mistakes. This is full of errors. So a, a classical computer scientist way of doing that would be, OK, I'm going to try to improve my metrics. Man. Uh, but there was a lately that we started from, and in computer science in general, we, we started from the view of you, the, the, the person as users. We now move to a view of the users as a source of data, more and more. And lately, we're looking at user even as processor. For instance, the recapture approach, where we use user to uh, recognize uh, digitalized uh, books, uh, even if most of them don't know it. And so we said, OK, can we do the same? Can we try to have, as a secondary effect of the usage uh, of our system, the uh, cleaning of the error we made? And uh, we, we built a search engine for Adem on top of what we've done. It allows them to search for energy. The system gives the answer it finds and also explains the inferences it uses, so the uh, variation, the narrower, the broader. And the person. The user, if he wants to improve the results of his search, can correct that. Okay. So doing that, the user believes he's improving his search. But of course, we are monitoring that. And every night, we analyze the feedback of the user. And we have an expert system that actually get, takes that feedback to clean the mistake we've done. And step by step, they improve the scissors for us. OK, so that was the first dimension directly on the folksonomy. A second dimension of the social system is actually the social uh, network behind the system directly, uh, what we can call uh, sociograms. Um, if, when you look at social networks, uh, the graphs they have, they look like that. You know, uh, have people and they have a link if they, uh, they are linked together, for instance, in Facebook. If, uh, if you look at semantic web, the graph we have are like that. I say, oh, there is Fabian, he's of type man, he wrote that, blah, blah, blah. And by the way, I know that any author is also a creator, and I know that any man is also a person, okay? The start of uh, processing I'm going to do on the first graph is more, a lot of processing is structural. For instance, I'm going to look at the degree of the people. I, I took a very simple one here. So the degree of Guillaume is four, which gives us an idea of its importance, local importance in the network. And the sort of reasoning I'm going to do in this graph is, for instance, to enrich the graph using the semantics I know. So add a new arc, say there is a creator because of that, or add a new type here, saying Fabian is a person because I knew that. And the question we asked in this second PhD of uh, Guillaume Retiro here is, can we merge both worlds? Can I do structural analysis of social graph, taking into account the semantic of the link and the enrichment? Why should I do that? Well, let's take Guillaume again. From a purely social network analysis, five here. Now I would like to be able to ask the question, what is the degree of Guillaume from a family point of view? And of course, family is defined in an ontology. And using the semantics of the links and the inferences, I would like to be able to only select the relevant one and be able to say, from a family point of view, Guillaume has a degree of three. So this is a very simple example. There are many different 
metrics I'm not going to go into in social network sciences, such as uh, betweenness centrality. Of them, what we've done <coughs> is to parameterize them so that they can take into account the typing and provide them a formal definition in Sparkle, this query language I mentioned before, so that they are really ready to be run on the Sparkle engine. So this definition is not only a formal definition, it's a constructive formal definition that can be run to calculate the result on the social network. So for instance here, <coughs> the betweenness centrality here can be parameterized so that I know that someone is really central in a network because he's between a lot of people, and that can be written in Sparkle using that formal definition to run it directly. So we tested it with a small social network, which is called Ipernity. It's a small social network that is uh, specialized in exchanging uh, holidays photos within your family network. And the very nice thing is that uh, they gave us all that data. They shouldn't have, but they gave us. Uh, which is about 60,000 profiles, uh, half a million links. But more interestingly for us, the links are typed. We know if it's a friend link, if it's a comment link, if it's a professional link. We know that. And what we've been able to prove is that using the typing and the parameterization, when you analyze the network, for instance, to find, uh, to, to, to detect the health of the network, you can analyze it in different dimensions. An indicator of the health of a network is that the largest connected graph in the network is of the same order than the network itself. That's an indicator of the health, for instance. And what you see here is that for every typing dimension, the size of the network is comparable to the largest component, which means it is healthy in all these dimensions. We also have to show that the list of central people in the network depends on the type you consider. So depending on the action you want to do on the analysis, for instance, if it is to diffuse a message, you're going to consider some types of links, but not others. And using this analysis, the list of the central user of the network will be different depending on the perspective you take on the network. The second thing we've done in uh, uh, analyzing this uh, network is community detection. So there are many ways of doing community detections, but the thing we want is only to be able to detect that a community exists, but to have a clue as to why the community exists. And since I'm considering epistemic community, the why is what is the shared interest? What bind them together? What is their shared interest? So I want to be able to detect the community, but also to label it. So we've been to do that detection algorithm, which is not really good if you evaluate it from a modularity point of view, which is one of the usual way to compare community detection algorithm. But it has a very, very interesting approach for us. The idea of this algorithm is as, as follows. You take the network and you associate to each people in the network a random label. And then you iterate at every iteration for every node in the network. You look at the most frequent tag around you and you take that tag as your new tag. And you do it and you do it and do it. And what happens is that at the end, only a very small set of tags survive in the dense part of the network. And you can detect two communities here where only one tag actually survived. Okay? So we change that. And instead of using random tags, we use the tag of the users. And instead of doing just frequency analysis, we allow merging between the tags. And how do we allow merging? Well, we reuse the Cirrus we automatically created before. So for instance, if someone is using rugby and foot, I look at the scissors, I know there is a common ancestor, which is sport, and I can allow myself to merge it, to merge this one as sport. Especially if one of my neighbors, hockey is also sport, and football is also sport. So I have a huge pressure on sport, I'm going to merge them. And at the end, I get the community detection, but also I get labels for that. So uh, I made the choice not to show you any formula here. I don't think so. it's fine. There's a paper of Guillaume if you want the detail. It on Adam uh, with 2,000 agents, uh, 13,000 relationships, 3,000 uh, tags, and they are organized using the previous algorithm. The first time we run that, the algorithm it took a lot of time. It's a really CPU consuming. When it fin first time it crashed, it destroyed the machine, so I had to, to buy a new machine. Um, 
then I bought a new machine, which did it again, and you say, oh, I found two communities at Adam. I found a community about energy and a community about environment. So the good news is that the two E in Adam stands for energy and environment. The bad news is that Adam say, yeah, we sort of knew that that's our name. Uh, so we, we improved the algorithm so that you now have an ability to control the level of abstraction. And you can floor it. And of course, the second time we've been able to detect eight communities in Adam, which are completely different from their official organization. So it gave them a view on what were their current field of interest inside Adam. And one of the work we're doing now is to extend that to open forums. So we are actually analyzing Stack Overflow, for instance, which is not uh, an in, inside a, a corporation. It's an open forum. And we're doing that with an additional constraint, which is we want to be able to detect overlapping community. That is, a person can belong to several interest groups, of course. This data I have, and this result, we have an activity also on interacting with this result. We need to help the user interact with them. One of the researchers on my team is a psychologist, and he's uh, working on interaction design. Um, the very first thing we can do, because we have Semantic Web, is to improve, for instance, the way you interact directly with the web pages. Here you have an example of uh, the, the tool uh, that we used at Adam. Uh, it actually extends the way you bookmark in your uh, browser. Um, but the very nice thing is that whenever you want to bookmark, this new bookmark system actually looks at the metadata contained in the page and pre-fills everything for you in the bookmark. So here, the system already detected that it's about a newspaper article. Uh, it extracted a summary. It even extracted the feedback that the, the user gave on that website about. And you just have to tag it with additional tags to organize it. Then you can reuse the search engine I showed you before to navigate in that have been done by many people and also to see how your different topics link you to other people in the company. So if you start working on a topic, you can recreate, for instance, a group of interest around you. Every time someone is starting to work on a topic of interest for you, so if someone starts to work on solar panel and you said you're interested in renewable energy, the system is going to say, oh, Jerome is starting to work on solar panel. You might talk to, to him. And you can create your reports dynamically. So if you want to report on solar panel, you are able to create a report that includes widgets that are updated all the time, showing the activity inside your social network on that topic. So every time you come back to the report, the report is recalculated automatically. And that gave uh, birth to a new area of research in my group about uh, seeing the wikis to uh, web application development. So each uh, page is in the wiki I'm show showing you here, which is called Next, uh, Wiki Next, is in fact a conjunction of a program and a document and a database. So each page has three facets, and you can edit them. And the nice thing about that is that someone can create an, a web application, for instance, list, listing cities in the world, and someone else who doesn't really know about programming can, just as in any wiki, copy the page, copy everything in the page, and change one thing to adapt it. For instance, he just want the capital of Europe, and suddenly he created a whole new application re reusing the data and the queries of the other guy for his purpose. OK, a second change impacted a lot uh, interaction design is, of course, mobility. Uh, so we look at different ways of accessing uh, our application on a mobile. 
and exchanging information across the boundaries of, of a, a community, for instance. Um, but the more interesting, uh, interesting topic we looked at is can we actually use this linked data also to improve the way a given piece of data is presented to the user? use that to adapt it to the context of the user. Um, so that's the PhD of uh, Luca. And what Luca did is uh, created a small ontology uh, using the semantic web formats that I introduced before to capture a model of day of the context. Uh, it's the classical model of day of the context, but also to make it extensible. So anyone can add uh, its new, its own vocabulary inside to define, to describe some aspect of the context. For instance, you could add an ontology about university if you want to add aspect of the university to the description of the context of the user. And then the algorithm behind that, uh, a graph edition algorithm that is able in real time on the uh, mobile phone to compare the small graph that represents your current situation with a library of typical situation. So for instance, a uh, situation of a user walking in a street or someone at home at lunch break. All these typical situations are known as graph and we use edit distance between graph to find the closest one to you. So that means that whenever you're accessing, the system is able to adapt the data that is shown to you to the context you are in. So here the user is accessing the data about the Museum Le Louvre in Paris. It's the same URL, it's the same resource, the same data, but here it was detected that the user was walking downtown and we decided that address and phone were more interesting for him, while here it was detected he was on a tablet at home and therefore we went to another display. These links, they can also be used to propose completely different ways of accessing information and searching. Uh, so is considering the graph we have of all these data on them, not only from a logical point of view, but from a metric point of view. See it as a landscape that we can walk through. And this allows us to do what we call exploratory search engine that allows people to discover topics they don't know. The way it works is that we take this small, huge graph of data I've shown before, we take interest known of the user, and we propagate them using semantic spreading activation in the graph in order to discover new resources of the graph that could be recommended to the person. So that you can test it online. It's a, disc, it's a search engine we're doing with uh, Alcatel, Bell, and Lucent. Um, and uh, in that engine, or you can even let the engine look at your Facebook web page and take all your likes, find them in the, uh, 
the graph of data and use them as seeds to recommend you new things. So for instance here, the guy likes Pink Floyd, good choice, and then he's going to ask for a recommendation, and I think the result is, uh, yeah, so it's uh, because the system detected uh, Pink Floyd is in music, it actually automatically created uh, facets that are pulled directly from what is found online on the linked data, and he uh, recommended Radiohead, and you can go on discovering Radiohead, and you can even ask the system to explain why it selected Radiohead, what there is in common between Radiohead and Pink Floyd, and so on. Uh, one of the oldest dreams in AI was to talk to the computer directly. Uh, so those of you who are old enough to know Elisa know what I'm talking about, or at least to simulate it. Um, and again, the use of uh, the linked data behind can allow you to do that. Uh, we're doing that in uh, that's the work of Elena Cabrillo here. Uh, she's working on the ability to query this huge amount of data in natural language. And her problem is to try to translate a natural language question into a sparkle question for automatically to get the answer for the user. So how does she do that? She does that with a very clever trick. She uses the fact that DBpedia is extracted from Wikipedia, which means for every data we have, 
we have the structured version of the data, but we also have the linguistic expression, the natural language expression. And so she mines this textual data to derive all the pattern, all the linguistic pattern that could be used to express a given fact. She builds a library of linguistic pattern and then she inverts it to translate the query of the person into Sparkle. The that looks like that. You uh, go to the website. Akakis is also online if you want. Uh, uh, when did John do Johnny Douglas die? The system is able to answer you directly. It actually says that it found the answer in the front. and the German version of Wikipedia. And then it can even show you that it automatically translated this question into the Sparkle query for you. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, we're also looking at using the knowledge representation approach on the linguistic domain. That is to consider the linguist as a domain of expertise that we want to model with ontology in order to capture all the knowledge they have about the language. So the PhD of, of uh, Maxime Lefrancois, he uses all the formalism of, of the semantic web I mentioned before to capture linguistic knowledge about a language. And he uses a representation of a linguistic theory, which is uh, meaning text theory. And allows him to assist the linguist in capturing the knowledge they have about a language. And our hope is, and that's a long-term objective, is to be able to bridge both results I just mentioned, that is the ability to do statistical analysis on corpus on the web, and the ability to represent knowledge of linguistic to improve each other, to be able to. So for the time being, it's very, really two different uh, end of the spectrum of research, but in the, the objective uh, in the end would be to uh, be able to use this knowledge to improve our mining and to use the mining to improve the knowledge we have. Final dimension we are representing about the user. Uh, it's the, the, not only uh, the part of the profile where we give his name or interest, but also very volatile aspects, such as emotion. That's the PhD of, of uh, Frank Dell. Uh, what he did is that he, he, he trained a classifier, a machine learning approach, uh, to recognize different emotional states of a user using a webcam on the face. And he actually linked that to an ontology that allows you to represent the different dimensions and emotions in order to publish them on the web. And the result is, that's Frank. Um, he, he's being analyzed in real time 
uh, the blue dot moving here is positioning him in the emotional map. Here is the summary of his mood. And here is the annotation from the ontology that was picked to annotate him in real time in RDF. That could allow a system to actually send the emotional state of a user so that you know that the answer you got on the forum was actually written by someone who is really upset and you might want to consider that in answering. Okay, I'm be very quick, I have four minutes uh, left, unless I'm a second, uh, to explain you the machinery behind, uh, the graph machinery. Uh, it's the most technical part. I might lose some of you there. I apologize in advance. Uh, but just to show you that this is actually relying on, on uh, real uh, graph infrastructure. So we're developing in the team since 1999. Uh, we've been working on a semantic web engine called Coreskagram that allows you to uh, load and query data and schema, RDF and RDFS. And actually what you see here is the little interface you, we use to train uh, students at the university uh, that, that allows them to query and see the result of the query. Uh, the idea behind this system is that you can look at the data, as I said, as triple or as graph, and we look at them as graph, and any logical operation of derivation can be to be seen as a graph matching operation. And we do everything through graph matching. And we use ontology, that is, even if a graph does completely, if we are able to prove with an ontology by the side that it should actually map, that is, for instance, vehicle does not map to car, but I know that a car is a vehicle, so I can validate it, uh, although it's not structurally true, the system does it too. This allows you to query, and that's the thing we see, you're seeing here, we included it in a, a graph visualization platform that is called Gephi, that allows you to query the web of data and get the result. Here you have the same algorithm, nearly the same query, we only change the category. Here we are looking at the, we are asking DBpedia what are the relations between the philosopher. Here we are asking DBpedia what are the relations between the programming language. And here we are asking DBpedia the relation between the musical movement. Same algorithm, same system, nearly the same query, just sending the category of data we are asking. I don't want you to believe that is, this is all about uh, logical derivation, so I'd like to talk about my watch. This is my watch. It has only one hand. It's not broken. I bought it that way. Uh, it has one hand because you have to read it as a, a timer. You read it directly. So I could argue that I'm reading the time twice faster than you, which is not true, actually, from a cognitive point of view. On an average, I'm making a mistake of three minutes when I read the hour. But I'm OK, because I prefer to access quickly with less precision. 
When you do information retrieval, that's the same. Sometimes you're ready to get an information which is not perfect, but in a quicker way. And the ontology on everything I, I gave you before to do not only logical reasoning, but also metrical reasoning to do that. So instead of looking the, at the implication between them, here there is no implication between a truck and a car. No one is a super category. However, I can look at them in the tree and see if they are close together. And if they are close together, I can say, okay, it's not logically true, but it's not so far, so I'm not making a big mistake. So I can even quantize my mistake. And, okay, oops. Using that, I can build a search and say, this is logically true, 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 true. Oh, this is false, but not too false. So you might want to look at it. Okay, so it's not only about logical derivation, it's also using it as a metric space. Um, we can use the same approach to uh, solve the problem of distributed query. When you ask a query to the uh, web of data, the answer may be on different servers and may be distributed. So you use the same it's summaries of the content of the different base in order to be able, when you cut a query into small pieces, to know which part of the query should go to which server. That's what I'm I don't have the time for that. And the two last aspects are access control and explanation. Access control is machinery, this time not to find more information, but actually to prevent some information to be found. So we use the same reasoning and the same sparkle approaches to give constraints on the user. For instance, to say, only my colleagues should, uh, working on the same subject should see that document. And every time they make a query, we check that this is valid. And if one of the results violate that, it's ignored. So it's done using a bunch of interfaces here. And the current extension of that is to do the same kind of reasoning, not only on the right access, but on the licenses on the data. Because when you use different sources of data on the web, they might have different licenses. So the question is, what is the license to attach to your results? And we're using deontic logic to combine the different licenses and on the fly generate a virtual license for your result. And last dimension, explanation. Uh, it was uh, in an, an answer to uh, one of the uh, requests of Tim Berners-Lee who wanted uh, to have an OEA button in a browser. He wanted to have one where you can click and every time you don't believe a web page, the system explain why, okay? And in that time, we trained a uh, machine system to actually, first of all, predict the query even before you do it, so it's able to say, oh, your query is going to take ages. You might want to revise it. And also, your query, the system is able to explain the results. So it can prove to you why the result is valid. It can explain, justify, going step by step. And the work that Rakim right now is, because this explanation can be huge, is working on summarizing technique to give you the essence of the explanation. And then if you need more, you can go inside. Okay of the talk. So we move from a web of document that we all know to a social web where we reopen the writing aspect and people can contribute. And we're now moving to a server behind the scene, all the data are accessible to the machines so that they can do all sorts of intelligent things. It's important because many people believe that Wikipedia is done by humans. These are the top 50 contributor of Wikipedia. These are the humans. Okay. The others are the bots. So we are already working and interacting in a web where many of our community are hybrid communities. Okay. I have a funny story of Guy sending email to other users saying, you stupid, you stupid, stupid, and then realizing it's a robot. And there is nothing more stubborn than a robot. Okay. The web is spreading in the world. We saw that we can give you URI to everything. And as the web is spreading in the world, the world is spreading in the web. The complexity of our world is contaminating our web. And that's why I agree completely with Wendy. We need that the W, 3W of the World Wide Web have in front of them the 3M of a massively multidisciplinary method. The architecture of the web moved from action of users on document link together to action of user in-between through the writing aspect of the web to that 
externalized and directly accessible to program, and more and more to program directly composed on the web. And the only way we can find our way in this mess of resource is the metadata, semantic web, that we attach to each URI to know we're talking about person, a chair, a program, or something else. In order, I am convinced that he who controls metadata controls the web, and through the world of web, many things are world. Thank you.